Well, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Lizzie Bowden and I'm the head of adult services here at the library. And we're so happy to welcome village planner Bethany Salmon, uh, building commissioner and community development director Rob McGinnis, and historic preservation commissioners Alexis Graydon and John Bonin to discuss the changes to the Title 14 and zoning code that offer incentives for historic preservation here in Hinsdale. We're so excited to have this group of experts to give us the background on this program and to answer your questions. It's a really great opportunity for historic homeowners, especially now as we are in Hinsdale's 150th anniversary year. It's wonderful to highlight the fact that so many historic properties help make Hinsdale special. So also I wanna note that you can join us here Hinsdale's Bagley House, which is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's design home. And so then just before I turn it over, you um, have heard those of you in the room, but maybe not those of you on Zoom, that this is a hybrid program that is taking, in, uh, taking place in person and on Zoom. So when we get to the question and answer portion, we'll bring one microphone around to our in-person participants, and then we'll alternate between in-person. Yeah, in not gathering the speaker. And so then with no further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over. And thank you all so much for being here this evening. I don't have a speaker here. Microphone? Thank you. Oh, it's not here. Okay, so I can start off and um, we can have this be more of a dialogue too. So if there's anyone on Zoom or in the room that wants to ask questions, feel free. Um, we're here to kind of just give you an overview of our historic preservation program. It's brand new. It was, um, a, we established our historic overlay district in September of last year. And so we are right now just in still the baby stages of developing our program. Right now we have 47 properties that are moving through our first round of homes and we already have the next round in process and we basically just can't keep up with the amount of interest that we've gotten, which is a great, a great problem to have. Um, so our, we created this program that is hopefully going to help um, homeowners be able to help preserve their home and choose restoration or rehab work instead of demolition. Um, so we have a couple of incentives that we're offering to people, um, which includes um, alternative bulk zoning regulations. So basically, instead of going through an entire variation process, we've created some flexibility to allow people to um, add additions to their home in a much more streamlined fashion, um, as well as expediting permits and waiving building permit fees. We also have some larger financial incentives, such as um, um, property tax rebate for the village's uh, property tax uh, portion of your bill and um, potentially a matching fund grant. So we're really excited about um, unveiling this program, getting our first round of properties on this list and hopefully being able to have people um, present their projects pretty quick to see what we can help them, them with to preserve their homes. So I don't know if you wanna say anything else. Sure, as a, as a bit of background, uh... The, the, the village has struggled with, with teardowns for years, and we were uh, uh, in the midst of the pandemic. We had a couple of um, really important houses uh, come down, and, um, you know, the question came up, what's it going to take, right? So uh, in, kind of a, in, in kind of a free-form manner, we set up a, uh, a, a Zoom meeting with uh, our local builders, uh, brokers, architects, uh, and we and we just asked the question, what's it going to take? What's it going to take to to move the needle and save some of these homes? And um, we got some good feedback, some candid feedback. And one of the responses that that kept coming up was, you need to create an environment where people can get more by working with an old home than they can if by simply scraping it and starting over. So we with that we we looked at. Um, uh, uh, roadblocks that people run into now uh, with renovations. And uh, John was very helpful uh, with, with some of his input. We had some input from the um, builders and architects. And um, what we looked at was uh, um, some of the specific, you know, bulk zoning relief we looked at were, were decreasing some of the setbacks, um, waiving height and elevation, which in many cases create a problem with the older housing stock. And, uh, and waiving FAR. Uh, FAR is a, a great tool to use to um, police internal bulk, uh, you know, in a, in a commercial building, in a condo. Um, but it's not so good a tool to try and regulate uh, interior bulk in, you know, a 150-year-old home where you've got uh, a lot of gable ends, uh, areas with ceiling heights over seven feet. 
And in many cases, we had people creating bad architecture, trying to get around an FAR definition mm -hmm. rather than, than take advantage of the existing ceiling heights, the existing gable ends, uh, um, and, uh, and, and, and making a conscious decision to work with that older home and uh, um, netting a result that uh, um, you know, by far and away surpasses what they could get with, with new construction. Well, uh, speaking for the Hinsdale Historic Preservation Commission, Chairman Bonin is our leader. I'm a commissioner on that, and we, our purview are, are the homes in the Robbins Park Historic District um, county line to Garfield to Chicago to 8th, I believe, or part of 8th and 8th. Correct, yeah, Southeast Central, which was the original um, William Robbins tract, um, one of you know the first original buildings, residential plots um, in Hinsdale. Uh, so we have been for the past, gosh, three or four years, trying working with a consultant, working to figure out how we can revise, which is Title Fourteen, the Village's Preservation Ordinance. Um, to save some homes. And we know that not every home can or should be saved, uh, but there were a lot that were coming down at a very quick rate. Um, these are homes that, um, you know, have been on these parcels since the beginning. And they're homes that were very um, architecturally significant, historically significant. Um, you know, architects from downtown came to Hinsdale to design these homes. And we were seeing them come down at a very alarming rate. Um, so we have to, you know, really commend Bethany and Rob uh, for their work on um, incentivizing owners of historic homes um, and, and educating, um, you know, future buyers if you're looking at purchasing a historic home. Um, and, and so while our purview is the Robbins Park Historic District, this uh, significant structures list, part of the overlay district, is um, really all encompassing uh, throughout the village. So it's all of the quadrants that we will review. Um, and we can get to that in a bit where that list lies. Um, but I think it's a really interesting time to take advantage of incentives and um, permit uh, fee waivers, expedited permits, and to Rob's point, um, the um, zoning variances and zoning relief, which is so important right now. Um, and I, I kind of equate it as, what can we give these owners of historic homes that um, owners or, you know, owners of new builds can't have. And that is really um, the ability to restore these homes and build bigger for your lot size versus tearing a home down or having a vacant lot and building from scratch. So I'm so happy you're here and we'll dive into the program. You wanna take us through this? Yeah. Okay, so um, we had a pretty good overview there. One of the things um, that I will say for our alternative bulk zoning regulations is it does allow you to um, basically increase height. So to go up to your tallest ridge line of your house um, where you've, uh, re we've increased lot coverage. So, you know, you might run out for a patio or a pool or certain accessory structures and we've allowed some limitation or some, some uh, leniency on that. And then in addition, reduce setbacks. And if you, for example, were going to be doing an addition or taking advantage of any of these incentives, um, it doesn't need to go through the full variation process, which can take sometimes three to four months, depending on um, if you need to go to just the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Village Board. Um, right now, you would give your plans to staff and then we would schedule you um, for a Historic Preservation Commission meeting. And the Historic Preservation Commission would then review it and just basically make sure that it's meeting general you know, preservation standards. So if you were applying for a preservation um, incentive and we're ripping off the entire front facade, this might not be a program for you, right? Um, there are some basic standards that you should be meeting and that will be reviewed, but it's still a much more expedited process. Um, 
with that, the HPC can also approve um, without going to the village board. They can approve your building permit fee waivers and we can um, approve an expedited process. So it's really something that we're, we're trying to encourage for, for people to go through a much quicker and cheaper process than normal. If you would like to take advantage of some of the larger incentives, um, we are also offering a
any house, any house yeah. is over 50 years, is a potential for us to work with you. Okay. Now, and after we look at your house, we then evaluate and, and you have to understand every year a new house comes on because as time arts is on, more houses become 50 years old. So it's a rolling, it's a rolling roster. If you will. And, and as that roster rolls, you'll find more and more houses that, that, that might qualify for our attention where maybe 20 years ago, you thought they might not. And I, and specifically up in the Northeast quadrant, the, where the uh, 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 north of the hospital and east of the hospital, there were a bunch of ranch homes up there called Cronenberg Ranch Homes. There are very few left now, but those are very important houses in our world because we they represent a certain time and a certain design, and they're historical in nature. And might or might not be involved in surveys that were done when we were doing the surveys back in the So it's a rolling rust. And anybody that has passion about their house, and if their house is 50 years of age, and if you think it qualifies for, for some of these incentives or should be designated as such, we want to hear from you. It, not every house may make the cut because there are certain criteria that the state employs on these things, which we have to follow. But uh, we want to encourage everyone to realize that it doesn't have to be a 10,000 square foot 19 or 1898 Victorian to be of interest to us. We're talking about a continual roster of homes in Hinsdale, and we're trying to save our heritage, basically. And we've got, and we've got a lot of reclaiming to do. We've, we've lost maybe 40% of our housing stock in, in the last 40 years. And it's because of a number of things, but mostly because we're not home rule by choice. So we have to follow the Illinois statutes. And as such, we, we can't do some of the things that people do in Wilmette or up in Lake Forest or where they have home rule, where they can make their own rules and stop all teardowns or whatever. We have to follow the Illinois statutes. So we're a little bit handcuffed. We have to work within the framework of the, of the governing premises that, that, that we uh, enjoy through the state statutes. But we are here to, to try and utilize every inch of those statues in helping anybody that has an interest in preserving the heritage of our town. So uh, again, my, I want to underline the fact all houses, great and small, and the whole village is part of our interest. It's really well put. Anyone else want to introduce themselves or tell us why they're here? Yes, I know exactly where that is. Great. Yeah. Great, right. great. Mm -hmm. the local tax so the tax incentive program um like i said that one's a larger financial investment uh where it would have to go first to the hpc for review and then final approval by the village board um there's a minimum incentive uh, investment i believe of fifty thousand dollars but it is um a rebate program that you get for up to five years um so you know, we've we've done an assessment. We're also happy for anyone who's interested of what that actually might mean for your house. Um, and don't forget that if you did put an addition on a house, your assessment probably would go up. Um, they'd reassess you. So it could be quite a substantial, you know, benefit for five years that you could get. We're happy to do like a quick analysis for anyone if they are interested for their specific property. And the same goes with the zoning of we've done individual analyses for people of what it actually means for them if they want to take advantage of this. And and just oh go ahead. Typical older houses you know, don't lend themselves to the family room kind of competition. Yeah. If you see ten houses in the family, they can recreate some fashion to address today's lifestyle. It's it's always trying to get that 
kitchen family room combination off the rear of the house. Good news is it's off the rear of the house. So we don't have to worry about facades and things where it might be contrary to saving the house. But the bad news is usually is that you want to extend that family room out to the rear. And all of a sudden you're bumping up against rear yard setbacks and things of that nature. And you don't have the room to add that extra 10 feet out. And this is what we've been addressing, Beth and Rob and all of us in analyzing Title 14 is how, how can we get some latitudes within Title 14 to allow us to take older homes and, and refit them to fit today's lifestyles without changing the nature of the house. If you will. That's really the challenge of many of our instances. Actually, pass the mic, and it's a really long leash, so kind of trying to have this. Yes. Thanks, Lizzie. Hi, Darlene. I'm going to pass the mic down to you. Um, we are about to undergo extensive renovation on the inside of our house. We are not adding on. Um, but I wanted to know what the tax incentives are for us if, since we're, we're not putting an addition on, but we are doing a lot of work on the interior. That's a great uh, does that apply to us? That's a great question. <laughs> and I can give it back if you want it. Uh, so the we do have um, certain things that are not included or not eligible. So historic preservation is really dealing with the outside of your house, right? At the end of the day, we don't really want to know what, what fixtures you're putting in your bathroom or your kitchen. That's something that really is with the homeowners, right? Um, so basically a lot of um, interior, almost anything interior minus some windows is not going to be eligible for this type of program. However, I will add one of the really exciting things that, that has happened in this round and the next round is that I've gotten a lot of owners who they might not actually even want to do some of this work. They know that they're even going to be selling their house pretty soon, and they actually want to get on this list as a way to market their home for the future. So you might not be able to, or might not even have a need for an addition right now, but a lot of people are asking to get on this list earlier rather than later, because it's pretty easy to get on the list early if you meet the criteria. And then, you know, if you were looking to do an incentive or a future person was looking to do an incentive later, it's much easier. You, you take one step out of the process. So that would be my, get on Darlene, I know that you probably have some exterior work too yeah. and, and configuring the garage area, correct? So all that's going to come into place. Right. Houses are too. Oh. <laughs> my husband is a native from Kingsdale. I don't know if that's not my husband. My husband really well. My husband grew up on the same block that we currently live on. His um, family home, his parents lived in it for over the years and they tore it down. Someone they sold it and our family tore it down and rebuilt. We lived on Lincoln right by um, <laughs> the Thames. And um, when the house, the uh, Tudor came for sale on Garfield, um, we jumped at it because it looked exactly like my childhood. So, mm -hmm. um, we love it. <laughs> Maintain and try to make it user friendly for, yeah, for me and our family with our four kids. So, I think it's a safe bet. I'm a contractor by background. Um, so, I spend most of my time building big buildings now in the city, but I think it's a safe bet to say that if you can find a, an older home and bring it up to today's standards, you've got the best of both worlds. Because we've been very unimpressed with a lot of the new construction that's been built in the last five years for a number of reasons. But, um, I live in a 125 year old house have for the last 50 years. Um, it's been a labor of love. Um, most of the times I enjoy it, uh, but uh, I can tell you it's an experience living in history. And, uh, we still have a number of homes in, in our general area here that, that can provide that kind of experience. And I, I would encourage anybody that lives in one to, to think twice before you abandon the project. And if you're thinking about buying an old one, 
and you want to talk to somebody, there are a number of us that can give you our insights into what it is to own a house like that. But um, it isn't as daunting as you might think. A lot of it's common sense, and there's still a lot of craftsmen. A lot of us have been around long enough to, to read out some of the, the various characters that are out there selling their wares. But these older homes are definitely their projects. Most of them are worth your attention, and all of them can be renovated. And um, you just have to have the right attitude and the right pocket to, to go forward. <laughs> Well, but but talking about starting from scratch, it's way more demoing. It's not going to last on. Right. It just is. That could go on and on. Enjoy when the tornado starting off and being down in the basement with my 16 inch masonry walls. Exactly. You weren't too blue. Uh, Michael Whalen, I live on uh, 24 East Eighth. Bethany knows probably more about my house and property than she would like to. Um, so I'll start by commending Bethany. She is actually a great resource and is extremely helpful and has helped us, um, again, a lot, a lot of handholding, uh, but we needed it. Um, we're interested, I think, primarily in setback relief because as Bethany knows, uh, I think all four of our setbacks are within a physical structure on our property, um, three of which are in our home. So that's a little unfortunate. Um, and I think it's just a creature of how we were zoned out on eighth. We probably, the prior owner probably sold a parcel um, to shrink ours into this sort of bizarre hamburger shape. Um, but we love it. It's not anything particularly distinguished, but it was built as the family home of a local architect who designed some homes downtown. Tragically, he didn't get to live there very long. Um, but Harford Field, he designed the... Uh, the old firehouse uh, on first uh, and did some other some other projects in town. Again, designed the home for himself, lived there, I think, five years. Then tragically, his wife got very sick and he had to move out, which is sort of a sad story, but uh, adds some character to an otherwise uh, small but old house. So we like it. We want to save it, but we want to adapt it to slightly larger modern families and usages. Um, but otherwise, it's great. What I'm really concerned about you, Jones, that 35 South Oak Street in my house is already, I looked at the thing, concluded on the significance. My house is ugly on the outside. It was built by a Chicago architect for a family. It's sort of a cross between prairie and craftsman style. I have like four foot overhangs. I never have to close my windows in the upstairs in the summer for the rain because it never comes inside because the, you know, the huge overhangs keep it. I do not have a rotten windowsill in the entire house, again, because of the design of the house. But it's ugly on the outside. Very, but it's it's um, my thirty five South Oak Street. It's a unique looking prairie mixed craftsman style home. Yeah, it was designed by a Chicago architect for a family, the McIntosh family. Uh, and Mr. McIntosh, the son, came out to the house and told us about the house. Um, so it was it, this was many years ago, obviously. But my concern is the fact that you put all this money into a house. You stripped all the woodwork, uh, you do all this stuff. And like 22, 225 First Street is on the demolition. And that is a beautiful house. I've been in that house. It has a first floor master suite. It has everything a modern family would want. So my concern is I put all this money in and then the next person comes. And because where my lot is located, it's desirable because I'm close to the train, close to the highways. Yeah. You can walk to town, you can walk to two train stations, and someone's going to say, ah, this is, you know, a quarter acre lot, I can build something bigger, fancier, etc. And then you've wasted all that time and money. Um, is there anything they can do to keep that from happening? So you're saying that your home at 35 is negatively impacted by the Kaiser's home? On no, first I'm street? not saying it's a shame. I've been in the Kaiser's home in Kaiser's right. house. Right. It's a beautiful house. Ryan. It has everything that you would need. It has the mudroom. It has the first floor master. It has, I don't understand, and, and very well maintained. I mean, I yeah. know because I walked by that house a thousand times, and every couple of years they were having professional painters, the most expensive painters you can have, re painting. I live across the street, so I've watched it for 50 years. Um, yeah. Uh, 
unfortunately, the people that owned that home, they lived in it, they were done with it, they put it on the market, and it let it let it go in two days for for substantially less than asking. Never tried to sell it as a house. We're content selling it as a teardown. So again, we we see these homes being torn down for all kinds of reasons, but it's First Amendment rights and people can do what they want. So there's no no control. If we were home rule and we put in some arbitrary rules about you can't tear down houses, it's a different story, but we're not home rule. So any house is, is, is prey to those that might want to tear it down under certain circumstances, no matter what we try and do. I, I grew up on, in, on the East Coast. Yes. And houses there, I mean, if you have a house that's from 1751 and you have preserved it, and if people want to do it, they want to keep it up. There's a little more tradition out there. Unfortunately, we're we're young Midwesterners, and then we're not ensconced in our houses for 300 years, and so our traditions are therefore our roots are less deep. I suspect. I think uh, we've been we've succumbed to the green ticket in Hinsdale, where if you have the green ticket, you can buy anything you want. There are a lot of green tickets rattling around, and a lot of our housing stock has been has been sacrificed because of just that fact that people don't have any interest in preserving our heritage. It's, it's a crime. We're seeing where we had three and four generation families here when I was growing up. No, we don't. We have the transiency. You might say that's good for real estate, but not necessarily. We find families that move into town now. They'll stay here for four or five years till the kids get through high school, and then they're gone. They don't care what happens to the house. They don't care what happens to the relationships they're in and out. So we become, instead of a village, we're becoming more of a suburb of Chicago. And we have to adjust accordingly. We stopped the building at first in Garfield of the four stories when they wanted to do lifestyle housing. Remember, we stopped that. So we do everything we can to try and preserve, preserve traditions and, and heritage. But there are still those that are avarice that prey upon us, come in, take our houses, knock them down, build something, and move on. It's okay. It's an industry. But Hinsdale has been been overly con uh, attracted to these types and it's our, our our fault and we have a big problem in 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 trying to pass laws that will stop that so we have to try and work within those part of that is the educational process you're seeing here tonight we want more people to know their houses could qualify to, to fall under the new criteria we're trying the carrots we're trying to put carrots out of them and encourage people to to renovate their houses and live in their housing stock this is all part of the educational component that we've been lacking. John, can I put in two cents verbally? At, this is Janie Petkus. On Zoom. Okay. <laughs> I'm on Zoom at home. Uh, and I, I want to commend you guys. I, uh, John knows I've been an interior designer in Hinsdale for almost 45 years. So consequently, I've worked on a lot of older houses here, but also all over the country because people understand the value of their architecture. And I'm commending you guys because this has been an uphill battle we've all fought for. And hopefully this will encourage people to maintain the integrity of our town. That's it. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Jonathan Thompson. Obviously, um, the the prospect of providing carrots uh, is appealing and uh, sort of a positive way to encourage uh, maintaining historic homes. I can tell you in the case of our home, I suspect the reason that no one bought the lot uh, and knocked down the house uh, was because our lot is non-conforming. And the the square footage, clearly the, the people that owned the house took advantage of even the limited sort of zoning relief that was available prior to sort of this new program to build the type of family room that you're talking about in a great room off the kitchen and so on and so forth. And the house simply wouldn't be replicable. Uh, if you were to knock it down and try to put up a new house, you would probably lose 1500 square feet. I wonder if there is sort of a, a 
a zoning arbitrage to be had to allow people to potentially divide up larger lots to prevent people from actually destroying houses. In my case, the lot is too small, but the question would be, is there a way to sort of arbitrage the current building limitations on new houses by revisiting sort of square footage versus lot size in order to prevent people from, I, I would gladly, if I had owned the house and there was an opportunity for me to sell a parcel of my land to my neighbor to expand their area, such that I could guarantee that my house wouldn't be knocked down because no one could put something up, not since the lot would be smaller, I would have done that. Now, again, I'm sort of a clever calculated lawyer type, but I would have done that. And, and so I wonder if there is an opportunity for that sort of thing going forward. So I, I've been with the village since 2006. Um, the village had contemplated uh, taking a look at our bulk zoning regulations um, just before I started. Um, I doubt very much that the board would have appetite for shrinking uh, lot sizes. And, and I understand the, the mindset there, um, but that was part of the uh, uh, rationale we used when we looked at uh, what we might be able to offer to encourage someone like you to take advantage of that old construction rather than simply scrape the house. I know that FAR has come down uh, a couple of times, uh, um, even going back to before I started with the village. Uh, there's no shortage of creativity in trying to get around those fault zoning regulations. I mean, we routinely reject plans for you know half a dozen square feet. So. A lot of creativity, a lot of you know opportunity to try and play games with the definitions. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't know that reducing lot sizes um, is, is going to have the effect that you're hoping for. But I think the board is, is keenly aware of the risks that come with uh, reducing lot sizes and the uh, um, potential for 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 that splitting those lots. Uh, and then that's constantly a battle. We've got lots and lots of inventory that sits on more than one lot of record. Um, and the board has been really consistent, at least in the seven years I've been here, with rejecting those requests to try and spin off uh, a, a vacant lot or you know demolish a house and, and, and you know move one over so we, we can sell more than one of those underlying amounts of record. It's a neat idea. But, but I don't know that it would have the um, result that, that you're hoping for. I think the, the risk is that you would just create more building. Uh, sure. mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have a good example. So 505 South County, uh, that, uh, uh, that house uh, actually sits on a, in several uh, underlying lots of records. Right, so so there are actually four uh, lots. The house sits on two of those lots, and then you have a lot on, on, on each corner. Um, the risk uh, in in taking those lot sizes down any further is that someone might be able to take those four lots and then split them again. So did that touch on the concern? Right. Thank you. I, I think to Rob's point, we don't want to set precedent either, um, especially in subdividing in, in the historic district, but we are seeing um, a very historic home, 505 South County Line Road, which is on uh, the home sits on two parcels, but the actual property is on four parcels. And um, the former owner, um, in, in order to protect the home, he um, requested a, a he ap applied for a zoning variant, correct? Um, to um, subdivide. So he thought that in the event that he would ever sell the home, that it would be more attractive to a buyer to have a home on two parcels versus four parcels for property tax reasons. And that was granted. Uh, he unfortunately passed away, and now we're seeing this home come back up on the market. Um, and so it's it's an interesting notion 
um, where I think it I think it could be beneficial for properties on multiple parcels of land um, to where there's enough square footage to subdivide um, within conforming within current code, correct? Um, so it's 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 an interesting notion. I think I think might be more applicable for uh, properties that are on you know a lot of acreage. I was thinking terms of the thing. Sure. So when we were creating the historical related district um, at our public hearing, I think it was at the public hearing, or maybe it was at the meeting, one of the trustees or planning commissioners said, are you sure this is all going to be enough? Like, as if it does that, does the zoning regulation go far enough? And to be honest, this is a brand new program. So the truth is, we're hoping that this zoning release is enough. It is definitely more than you can get with construction. We're hoping that this is a nice incentive package. But the truth is, this is a living and breathing program, and we're going to be monitoring it as things happen. And so it's not going to say that everything we're going to be doing in the and five and a couple of years, we're going to be that. So things like that, we're everything, other trends happening, we're going to be looking at what the zoning is providing. Just know that we're going to keep paying those things. So it's not um, everything that's going to be going on forever. There's something that needs to be amended. You know, And everybody, we've got another microphone now. Oh, hey, nice. So I'm going to go Hi, I'm Marianne Parks. I live at 38 South Thurlow in a 1929 house, but it's been remodeled a lot of times. So it doesn't look the way it did when it was first built, but it's a great house. Um, what I find frustrating in the village and wondering if any if more regulation could be placed on builders, I know this is a little bit of an aside, but um, is when a builder purchases a home, but he doesn't, he or she doesn't have a buyer yet. And the home sits and sits and sits and falls and oh, and it, it turns into, it maybe started as, oh, that's too bad. And I'm not talking about a super grand home, you know, but, oh, it's so sad that house is going down. And after a year or two, the consensus is kind of, oh, that house has to be torn down yeah. because maybe windows have been left open, broken out, doors kicked in, yeah. the lawn's not mowed, the, the, the pipes have frozen. I saw the run, water running into the basement through the window, walking my dog and I had to call the builder. Your house is flooding. Um, it is such a it's such a drag on a street, on a block, and on our community to have these homes sitting and and sometimes they weren't even in disrepair, but turning into this into a mess. And it, it's so sad and it's also frustrating as a homeowner. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you so much for bringing that up. And I call that demo by neglect. And it's actually um, the, these builders who are doing that are non-compliant. And I think Rob probably is so sick of hearing from me because um, again, our purview is just the Robbins Park Historic District. But um, I am, my, my honest to God mission is to keep these builders um, held accountable for once they purchase these homes, or even so, if the home closes and new owners buy it, the builders, um, you know, maybe aren't educated on code or the owners don't. But I have single-handedly called ComEd and NICOR and figured out when utilities were turned off. When you purchase a home and transfers, whether you think you're gonna tear it down or not, whether you're still in that four month waiting period, between drawing up plans and coming for HPC again, if it's in the historic district, you you have to be code compliant. And this is my biggest case. Uh, you know, 720 South Elm was a perfect example of a wonderful uh, of you know a a wonderful home, and utilities were turned off and windows were left open, and it was when we then are asked to walk through the home as commissioners to see that it's uninhabitable. I then turn to the real estate listing because in this day and age of social media, every realtor posts um, interior 
uh, videos of the home. And then, you know, I, we show that at our hearing that, you know, four months ago, this was um, a beautiful grand home. And so what happened? So for the record, the builders do this on purpose. So they circumvent the situation. We're not home rule. We mentioned that before. Uh, poor Rob and Bethany and his crowd down there, they have to police this. We're a small village. A lot of this going on. And when they decide to give a citation to that builder, we're limited to the amount of money that we can uh, ticket them. And frankly, the tickets are so minimal that the builder shrugs his head and does what he wants to So there are a lot of things um, that have to be addressed. A lot of elements of this, but make no mistake. When, when you see how it's drifting into disrepair, there's usually a, a reason for that. And it's not it's not for somebody forgetting to, to keep them up. It's, it's by design for some reason. So they can tear them down and not and then come before us and say well, it's not heavy. Right. This happened to us so many times in the last few years. So it's a game. I mean, in a sense, it's the, it's the builders against the preservation. And it's First Amendment rights against preservation. It goes on and on all over the country. And without a long rule, it's just a good idea to do what you know. And, and, and I won't go too deep into this, but we're not a little by choice because we've watched village government go astray for so many years that we didn't trust our village government to have a home. We felt the comfort of having the Illinois statute. So in one sense, we needed the comfort of the Illinois statute so that our trustees and boards and admissions didn't have their way in the way of the government. It took us many years to clean up a lot of identity in our village government. And I can tell you, the last 14 years, you've had pieces of that. For those of you who have been living a long time in the old for your newcomers here, you didn't have to go through what we've been through. We've been fighting this battle for 40 something years. Right? So we're on it. We have a big job to do from an educational component. We're trying to design tariffs and refer to people from all sides of the United States to the church and other stuff. I think that John's point, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a, a shift, a shift in, in, in people's minds. They're, they're, you know, we were the down capital of the country for so many years. Uh, I think a lot of owners that, that had homes that they simply couldn't maintain anymore figured, you know what, it's going to be straight in the so it was almost this, you know, this kind of, yeah, it's a form of conclusion. So it's going to take a lot of education on our part to try to promote this program so people know, hey, that these homes are, are worth saving. Where will all end up like South Bend? If that's what your vision is for him, you know, do nothing. Okay. But if you, if you came here extensively because you like something, you better pay attention because you got to work at it because there are forces working against you. So one of the things we've all had in attendance of the reservation um, is that this program can be taken in five. Um, and, you know, we, we set it up so we're working on it. If you are looking to flip a home, you can actually use the hotel to help us find out how to take advantage of the hotel. So, so we set it up here, you know, know the developers are going to be the easy one, and then as we train them, they're going to go on. So, so we're happy to have been able to pull them to the house, to do the right thing, to the church, you know, and then uh, Sorry, I don't mean to go off program necessarily, but I have a selfish question. Um, I'd love to hear about the process from the HBC perspective. What are you looking for? How, how do you envision something coming through? And as Bethany probably knows, we're kind of champing at the bit, but we want to do it the right way. We want to make it through the process and there's not a lot of precedent. Um, so, so it seems a little unknown, but would love to hear what that looks like. In terms of uh, being approved for the significant structures list, um, the district? 
I guess, being approved and then coming in front of you with plans that we think is conforming to the various relief. Again, we're interested in setback relief, but whatever sure. that may be and sure. making sure that we're doing the right thing. Well, I think I can speak to um, the overlay district list and then maybe you can talk about plans. Um, again, your address is? Uh, 24 East Dave. Okay, so you are you in the historic district? No, what side of just outside. Are you in? He's, he's on our 24th Oh, you know the house. Okay. Yeah, it makes me makes me feel good about the house. <laughs> uh, uh, we're the Shake House, just one in from the corner, south side of Eighth, west of Garfield. Thank you. Right, right, right. Yes. Um. So I think from the HPC, HPC perspective, rather, um, we're looking to see how these homes meet the criteria. And I know that Chairman Bonin uh, said this earlier, really, it doesn't have to be a, um, you know, architecturally significant home. Really, it's we wanna see criteria of, is this a, a prime example of um, this type of architecture? Is this maybe one of the only types of architecture in the town? Did the um, builders, the original builders contribute to the founding of the village. There's a long list. And what we have found on the first round of approving or um, approving to the board of the significant structures list um, that these homes, you know, met several criteria. And again, a lot of these homes were, you know, wonderful bungalows or, you know, not palatial, you know, for a parcel estate. These were homes that um, we could easily see, okay, you know, the, the lot was purchased in 1904, um, permits were issued or, or plans, construction started, you know, three years later. Um, and we can tell, you know, in tandem with the historical society, which I'm a trustee for, um, that, you know, these people then contributed to X, Y, and Z. Again, like these, you don't have to fit every criteria at all, but, we had so many homes, multiple addresses that that checked off several boxes of the criteria, which I think was really fun for us to see because we only needed one criteria to nominate it for the list. And and you know Frank and I were like, wait, but this one too, and this one, and this one, right? So um, again, forty-seven houses in our initial hearing. Only one was in question. All 46 has one or more criteria and we're qualified for a hearing. Hopefully, hopefully not 24 East Day. Sorry. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Um, and again, the one I questioned, we just wanted more feedback because it had gone through significant renovations where, you know, again, to Bethany's point about um, altering the facade, it was really hard to uh, connect it to its former yeah. um, integrity. Exactly, the integrity. Right, right. So I think from that perspective, we don't want to discourage anyone. Um, we want everyone to apply for this. And with all 47 homes coming before us, it really was um, not daunting on our end. And we really gave us a lot of opportunity to, to realize um, how many of these structures really were significant without being significant, maybe from the layman's eye of, you know, driving down the street and, you know, four, four parcels and huge gates, which are, right? No, these were just, you know, everyday homes that really make up the historic map of Hensville. And I'll let the second part of the question. Yeah, so for, for say you were applying for an incentive to make changes to the outside, um, which is what I think you're asking about, there are what's called secondary interior standards for rehabilitation, and it's basically what any preservation uh, program anywhere in America will use to judge buildings and, and change. And so I think those, that will be the foundation of when a, you know, changes to a building are proposed. Um, that's what the HPC is going to be using to review those projects. But there's also some common sense behind it. Like I said earlier, 
Like if someone is claiming to be preservation and they're trying to rip off the entire front facade, you might not be doing preservation. I mean, in this program, this might not be for you. So um, I think it's going to be really exciting when we get some of our first um, applications, and um, that should be hopefully in the next couple months, while we still are trying to catch up with all the other people who want to be on the list. So it's it's a good problem to have, and I think we're excited about bringing some new projects. In some cases, so the like the job plan put together here on the list. Um, we would look at it as a staff level group. Um, if it would, if it was limited to uh, a plus zoning group, uh, through the review, uh, building permit fee waivers, the agency would be the approver, uh, and, and and that would be it. Uh, we would you know get the review done uh, as quickly as we could, and we get to end away. You know, in, in, in 28 years of doing this, I've yet to see a perfect set of drawings. So generally, there, there's some back and forth, but certainly we will try and move those projects to the front of the line uh, and review them in the house as quickly as we could uh, to try and get things turned around. In the event you were looking for uh, um, a, a factory date uh, or uh, you want to get on the, the rebate program, um, then the APC would uh, still serve as the approver, but then make a recommendation to the board of trustees. Um, the the rebate program uh, is, is limited to the uh, the amount of funds that is available in that in that given year. So when the when the board of trustees uh, is 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 allocating funds, you know, for that upcoming budget year, they've got to earmark uh, a certain. Uh, amount of money to to, to fund that line item. Um, again, to our point where when we opened up, right? It's a great problem to have to be able to say, hey, the kitty's empty until you know next year. That's a that's a wonderful problem to have. Um, so I, I hope that helps kind of at, at a really high level kind of lay out the program. So you know if it's if it's going to uh, uh, be limited to uh, uh, the 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 cost of the building permit uh, and the and the zoning relief, then the APC can can keep that at the APC level. Uh, and if not, if it goes beyond that, then it would have to go on to the Board of Trustees. So certainly we would parallel the process and um, expedite that review to whatever we could to try and, 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 and keep that momentum moving. And we just did a pre-plan review for a house as well and gave them two options. One of which is what it, would it mean if you're on the overlay district, if you wanted to do an addition and what are your bulk zoning regulations normal wise. So we were happy to do in the beginning stages that pre plan with as well. One other thing I mentioned, uh, the historic preservation commission set up members of the community. And uh, we'd like to think that we are pretty well grounded in, in the subjects. We have two architects, um, uh, members, um, Jim Frisbee from town, both the board were raised, Captain Jim Frisbee. We have Frank Gonzalez, who's a historic architect, worked on the rookery down in Chicago, did a number of jobs in New York City. Uh, we have people obviously involved in the historical society, all the various elements in, in the village, but we're there to give advice too, if sought. Um, our architects, at no cost, will go out and look at the project, will give you ideas on how to approach them. Um, perhaps even give you some thoughtful and methodology or not even know how to do that. So we're there to research, not just a process and application. Well, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it's one of the years. I didn't know that. I mean, that's that's really some. I wish there was like an article where you say it's like. So the educational component. That should been, be called out. We've fallen down on that. Okay. That should be called out. Awesome. Thank you. I've been Googling a bunch of leaders, but that's a legend. This is an aside. A few years ago, we, we, we did First Street, the brick. And I have noticed that the brick where they've been doing the construction is getting Damaged. destroyed. Yes. Oh, and I, yes, that's also a pet peeve of mine. Right. Yes. Is there anything we can do to make them repair it or something when they're done? Because so yeah, so I, I and I actually called about that in the past. Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh, I, I, no trucks over a certain amount of weight can be on our brick street. Um, and if we do see that, and thankfully for First Street, two commissioners live on First Street, so we kind of. I didn't pay to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I have um, maybe called Mr. McGinnis very early in the morning. Get that Donegal truck off the Brook Street, and they were lovely. And even the the person, the foreman from that company was was wonderful and completely understood our concerns about the brick streets. But yeah, they are um, responsible for making sure that our bricks stay intact. So the one house that they're drawing on the corner. Correct. They can go in on the concrete or the tar side. That is what we that is what we approved because That's originally what doing. What? I'm concerned about the next one. Yeah. In the middle of the block. Right. But I mean this one they could have and I actually called yeah. and I noticed Thank that they you. did start going because I complained. That was and all the same side. day. <laughs> and then now I've noticed that they're going, there are two openings. They're so loading on oak. So. Correct. We we made sure that they started loading on oak. Rob had um was really great at, at providing a solution, a quick solution to rectify, you know, that they had to just kind of change the configuration of their fencing and loading so that they could load on the the concrete and not the the Brook Street. So, so you're watching that? I'm where you are. <laughs> this is really for my education because I, I don't know the answer. To, to what extent is the village involved in approving sort of architectural plans for new construction once things have been torn down? Because one of the concerns is, and, and I'm thinking in particular of a beautiful house on 8th, I apologize, I don't know the address, but it's a Georgian on a double wide lot, beautiful brick home that I think the owner has decided uh, they couldn't afford to restore. And so they've put it back on the market uh, and I would hate to see it Sure. Go. It's very close to county line. House is very special. Uh, that's that's right. That's right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And I and I wonder again. And, and I I'm I'm going to sound terribly draconian and 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 overly legalistic. But you know, it occurs to me that that someone who buys that house, if they do intend to tear it down, um, what limitations are what yeah. limitations are there on what they can put up in in place of such a beautiful structure and yeah. and that strikes me as another way to potentially discourage destroying these beautiful homes so i think this this harks, harks back to chairman bonin's we are not home rule um unfortunately there's little we can do outside of you know educate i've been trying to educate uh people uh, potential buyers at home did go under contract over the summer. Um, the current owners, um, we understand through hearsay that they do plan to tear that down. They cannot do so until they come before the HPC. And we normally um, have, you know, at least two hearings to uh, review what we call a certificate of appropriateness. And we really love to see the builders come to us um, you know, in the early stages so we can give them feedback. Um, again, we we really want to see something historic built in its place. And that's tough, again, because HPC is advisory. So we have to just have a vote, yay or nay, and they can get their building permit. Sorry to dominate this conversation. The, so in the historic history, Nothing can be built that's modern in that district. However, yes. however, my cause to slip over the last many years, all this modern demonstrations, these floor to ceiling windows, you're looking right through these houses, you're looking right at the stairwell. This to me is modern. I don't know any other way to call it. And as a commission, we sit there and we try and discourage. We, we now make the owner of the house come before us, or the floor, the employer record come before us, architect come before us, 
He now makes his own opinions. He can bring the little question. So we can talk to him and say, you are not keeping the spirit of this sort of discipline. As much as you think you have a First Amendment right to build what you want to build, the people that bought houses on that block, they also have certain expectations. And if you're going to build something that doesn't fit, you've now damaged what they perceive as streets and they invested their money in their interest. I haven't won that yet. Uh, we finally put our feet down on our last meeting and told an architect basically, you just can't do it. Just, you can't do it anymore. We've been plagued by one architect and one building in the historic district that have been putting up the time. And we've tried to discourage them, embarrass them, castigate them, cocktail parties, drivers, wherever we can. We haven't really won that. But that's the fine line we walk. And that's what we do in the historic district. When we get outside the historic district, we get more further. Other than how it's appropriate, we made that town office so that we can offer consensus to all kinds of things. But yes, we can't tell somebody outside of the historic district to want to know the So again, we focus on certificate of appropriateness, and this is why we have architects on our commission who are well versed in um, what we call preserving streetscapes. Um, and it's if you're taking down a historic home, we hope that something that you know resembles somewhat of a historic home goes in its place. And and does it work always? No, but we. Right, an Italianate or, or something versus just stone glass. Um, I mean, these, these new homes are lovely. Uh, they just don't fit in the historic streetscape, um, especially in Robin Park Historic District. So we are really trying to educate builders and homeowners to come to us early on and show us their preliminary plans so we can give feedback. Um, you know, again, it's it's a collaborative effort. It's not that we're judging plans or we're just making um, you know, suggestions on how the home could fit more um, with with neighbors and you know fit within the streetscape. Thank you. And I do have a Zoom question. If uh, are there any follow ups to this one? Okay. So. Um, the question is, I understand the incentives from the program mostly apply to exterior preservation and zoning. One of the other elements of preserving and maintaining an older home includes some of the inner guts of the home, like HVAC, electrical, plumbing, for example. And over time, these systems need to be repaired, improved, or replaced. These types of older systems are unattractive to buyers and are one reason buyers are pushed towards new construction. Is there a possibility that these types of improvements may be included as incentives in the program in the future? Um, as of right now, no, um, we don't have that as um, an incentive. Uh, the interior work, it, it gets a little tough, and there's not many preservation programs anywhere that I'm aware of that actually will pay for any interior, with some exceptions, though. Um, you know, one could argue the foundation of the house it is somewhat of the interior, right? Um, so, obviously, a store home might need to have their foundation or stonework where you have pointed. Um, that's something that is a lot of the time actually included in the sport preservation program. Um, so, so there is a lot of stuff, and obviously, if you can help pay for some of that exterior work, foundation work, window work, that's a lot of money already. So, hopefully, that will offset some of the costs and you know be able to um, provide a little bit of flexibility for getting to some of the other HVAC systems as possible. Well. Just to add to that, um, in my mind, Every 15 or 20 years, homes need, um, you know, HVAC work, plumbing, electrical, et cetera. Um, more of like the 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 common maintenance of these homes. And um, yes, I I applaud homeowners for taking on these old homes because yes, that all has to be done. But I think why maybe they're not included is because, um, you know, these are are uh, upgrades that need to happen more commonplace than masonry work or foundation work or windows. 
um, more of the staples that you would see that would need to be done in a historic home versus, you know, now these homes that are, you know, built in 2005 are coming up through, you know, a lot of that more common maintenance. And I'm not belittling that, um, those upgrades, because believe me, you know, I've been through that so much and, and it's a pain. And I wish that there was a resource for those for older homes. But really, I think it's um, these renovations that make um, these historic homes unique versus these homes built in, you know, the past couple of decades. So, one thing that comes to mind of digging out a basement. To me, that qualifies. What we're trying to do is make these houses live on long and fit today's lifestyle. So here you are, you have a house, you know, you've got seven feet in the basement. By the way, one over at the William Robbins house on, on 6th Street, literally had slabs of limestone. We didn't even have concrete. We were on limestone slabs on dirt. And uh, we took that house, we built 1864 Civil War, okay, and and the, and we found the right fire, and we added on to the back of the house, and we added on to the back. We dug out the basement, and 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 we ended up with a with a workable lower level. People want these things, and you're trying to decide what people want in a house. Usually the kitchen, and then it's the family room, and then it could be the master bedroom or the lower level in that order. So digging out a basement, in my mind, that counts. Things that you might not think, but we're trying to give these homes more life, so they can provide a good shelter in front of those who are inside the home. Hi again. <clears throat> I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 20 plus years ago, the village came up with some incentives for builders, which I'm not trying to promote incentives for, for developers or builders right now, but um, which I believe one of which was, if you built your new home with a front porch, an open front porch, you got a square footage credit for your new home. If you built your new home with a detached garage, you were awarded a square footage credit. Now, Lord knows, I don't want these new homes to have more square footage. They already seem to have so much. But I wonder if perhaps um, there's another one of those that you could enact to discourage some of these styles. I mean, that was that was in it. Those and are those still in place? I imagine they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's and maybe easy. there's something else that. Always a link Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe we could tell the builders that they are going to get a negative square footage credit if they put those big windows in anymore. How about that? <laughs> Minus 1,000. Oh, I guess we won't put those in. I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> part of the problem that we have is we took a zoning code off the shelf for part of this back in 1980. Rob would be the first to tell you. Um, we took their code, tried to make it fit our time. Uh, over in the Southeast Quadrant, probably 95% of the lots are non conforming compared to the code. Our zoning code is impossible. Any of us would tell you that, any builder would tell you. We spent two years rewriting. We had we had consultants in the Camaros. We thought we were going to have it all done, and then the project went sideways. There's a real reason to rewrite the zoning code. We should do away with FAR for area ratio. Rob and I know that just a joke. Um, there's all kinds of things that can be done, but uh, it takes time, it takes money, and you got to exist in the interim until you get these things done. To your point. There's always cause and effect when you put things in a zone, trying to solve one thing and create two other problems. Yeah. Any other questions? It looks like we don't have any more questions. Anybody else on Zoom have a question? 
All right. Well, I think, thank you so much for coming tonight. It was so incredibly informative. I learned so much and I, I think I probably speak for everybody. So thank you again. We would invite any of you to come to our HBC meetings. Uh, we, we enjoy audience participation. So if you have specific questions and just interested in what's going on in the village, please come and join us. Next meeting will be a month from April 5th. Right. At 6.30. In the in the village hall. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Yeah.